Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers, and thank you for joining me at part nine of the Employee Manager. We've got a packed show. We've got automated tab order to show you. We have automated tab switching based on shortcuts, which is going to be great. We also have added a ton to the scheduling, including automatically scrolling to particular lines, which is going to be great. We've got uh, additional features, including capacity and a very secret way of automatically adding events within just seconds, which I'm going to show you. So let's get started. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you for joining me today in today's part nine of the Employee Manager. We have so much to cover. We're going to get started right away, but first I wanted to show you something that many of you have been asking me, and that is the Reports and Graph, the Excel Advanced Reports Dashboard Masterclass, which is now open, and of course, I'll include a link down in the description there but this is basically an amazing work that i have done over a year that includes single click report generation it's going to show you the ability to toggle any column just by clicking on those columns I also have the ability to create custom reports or select custom reports modify custom reports and they can include uh, any type of information including a custom date range and if you want to update that or save those just click the update it'll update that custom report and that includes custom columns as well so if you only want to show or hide specific columns for this custom report select those columns click update so we've got a ton of features including custom and hide columns we have the ability for partial and exact match on filter which is a great feature we also have uh, the ability to filter based on amounts. So if you want to filter based on amounts, we're going to show that to you as well. As well as the date range, we've got save as, uh, save as Excel, save PDF picture or custom report. We've got email as Excel PDF or picture. We've got the ability to print to any specific printer in your computer and this list will automatically generate based on that so that's a great feature there's actually so many features in this it's a full 15 hours of training where you're going to learn so many things so if that's something you're interested in go ahead and click the link down i'm glad i got a chance to show that to you let's move on to the training for this week again part nine we've got so much to feature again we've started off with tab feature where we're going to show you how to tab through fields and set that up that's a really great handy feature and i know it's something that was requested by so many of you so we do need to get to that also one great idea by one of our uh, listeners and watchers was the ability to switch tabs based on a shortcut key and as you'll see here we've got different shortcut keys so if i click my shortcut key control t or control h will move there control d will move to the payroll details control u control L for leave and control E for events. You can set your own control keys, but that allows us a user to easily switch between tabs using just the keyboard. So that's a super cool feature. We're going to show that to you. I have also updated leave where we've actually add the ability to add leave. I haven't had in the uh, formulas yet, but we have had that so that when you make a change and when you add a specific leave to any particular employee, that information is going to automatically be saved. And then so the next time we return to that employee, it's automatically going to be there. So that's a great feature. We're going to show that to you and exactly how we did that. And uh, let's see what else we've got so much. In fact, I've got an entire list. If we look down here, we'll see we've got a, a large list tab order shortcut keys employee leave i have an amazing uh, cool way and the scheduling we've added a ton of features we have the ability to search to quickly locate an employee either whether it's an exact employee for example let's just say we want to find brz i think brz's that'll bring us right to that row but what if we wanted a general what if we just wanted br we could do that and it's going to bring us all the way to the brs so we can search based on exact or partial name on our find. So that's a really cool feature. And that's basically an automated scroll. So I'm going to show that to you. I have the ability to add events, as I told you, simply by right highlighting, right clicking, 
selecting a right click we're going to show you how to do this and for example we can click holiday boom and it's done all we need to do is add in notes holiday and then click save back to the schedule we go and we're going to see that that event is automatically added in so there it is so automatically the name is automated so it's a super super fast way to add events to the schedule and I'm really excited to show that to you we also have capacity here this is a formula and conditional formatting based on the capacity of the day when we want to offer people time off or let them know if they should take time off we need to know what our capacity is if we're running at a 50 or 60 percent capacity we may not be able to offer them time off but if we're at 100 percent capacity maybe we can offer them so as this schedule fills up you know as you add text here you'll see that this number this percentage goes down right so as events get added in here it's uh it's automatically down so that's based on i'm going to show you that percentage as well for those of you that don't want to see that capacity, I've added a little checkbox here. So just check that and it'll hide the capacity or check that and it's going to show the capacity. So there's a ton of features. This is a partial feature. It's not quite ready. We're going to be able to display names on that. But I'll just put a marker there so that we can select specific positions that we want to display in only those positions. That feature is not ready yet. That's just a place marker there. So we're going to get to that very soon. So I'm really excited to show that to you. Let's go ahead and get started on the training and we're going to go back to the employee manager where we've automated the tab orders. Now this is a feature that I have shown you in the past, but we're going to go over it again because it is highly requested. People want to be able to know how can I automate the tab orders. And in fact, this one it's a little bit more complicated because we have multiple tabs. You know, in this tab here, we've got three. In this tab, we've got three. In this tab, we've got 10 of them automated. So we have to differentiate between where they are in order to do that. So let's do that and show we how that is done. All right, so the basic idea is to give the user the ability to tab between those fields and just those fields where they can enter and not the other fields. And we want to be able to set those fields. And so that is the idea, and it's a most software has that, so we want to include that. And of course, you can customize this to, you know, if you find you want to tab to different fields, it's very easy to customize. And let's go ahead and show you just how we did that into the developers, into the Visual Basic, and let's go ahead and take a look at that. You can find the tabs under tab macros. Let's go ahead and take a look at that auto tab macros. It's called. It's a module there. And we've got a few different macros on there and we'll go through them briefly, but I'll show you the main points that you need to focus on when you want to modify these. The first macro, this sets it on or off. Basically, when we set on key to true, when this is true, for example, when we activate the employee manager, we're going to set it to true. When we activate the employee manager, we're going to set it to true. When we deactivate this sheet, we should set it to false. Okay, here it is right here, deactivate. So that means right now we only want it on employee manager. Eventually, as we add tabs to more sheets, we may turn it on for additional sheets. But right now, it's just the employee manager. So we've turned it off. Go back into the auto tab macros. When it's false, we are going to do these, set these. We're going to reset it when it's false, doing this. With the application, so for example, if the state, meaning if it's true, right, then we're going to automate the tab. We're going to automate enter, right, left, tab down. We're going to automate all these features to different directions. And basically, we just have next and previous, and then we have arrow up and arrow down. So that it basically, it tells the computer, what should I do on on tab, run this macro. Enter, right, left tab, do this. Okay, so that's how we're going to do that. And basically, what we need to do is before we set that, we need to get the tab order. We need to know what order of the cells should we tab order. And that's called something called get tab order. Get tab order. That's going to be as a variant. And what I've done here in this case is I'm going to say if the active sheet code name equals sheet one. Now, why have I done that? Well, the code name is sheet one, sheet five, sheet four, sheet three, right? And I've done this so this way it gives the users to view, the end users or the programmers, the freedom to change the sheet names without having to affect this code. And so that's a nice little feature. So I've done the active code name. If the active sheet code name is sheet one, this gives us the freedom to change the employee, especially for those of you who, you know, are in different languages and want to change.
change your sheet names, you can without affecting the code. So we're going to use the active sheet, the code name in this case, and that tests to see if it's the employee manager, and we have the freedom to change the name of the employee manager. Now, if you'll notice in our, in our employee, we have different tabs. For example, if we're in this tab, General Info, we want to move from F6 to I6, then to F8. But if we're in this tab, we want to move to F26. So we need to differentiate those tab orders based on the tab that we're in. And how do we know? Well, for example, we know that if the current row is probably less than 24, then we know this is the tab. However, if the current row is 26, we know this. If the current or active cell row, I should say, is 46, then we know. So we can use that differentiation to test, and it is that test that we're going to run. So the first test was to make sure that we're on the employee manager sheet. The second test is to see where we are, where we are, where the active cell is based on the row number because different rows if we're all the way over here our row numbers are going to be probably 140s if we're on leave or something we need to tab between those it's going to be 182 so we can use that row to differentiate and run our test and that's just what we've done here if the act is sheet one then continue and now if the active cell row, we were just talking about that, if the active cell row is less than 19, that's probably tab 1, right? Less than 19, general info, what's 19? 19 is here, right? So if we're in here, we don't need to worry about that. All we're doing is selecting the attachments. So we don't need a tab order for this. We just need a tab order for these. The user doesn't do anything except select specific attachments once they're added. So if their active cell is less than 19, then create a tab order based on these cells. So that's the first test. So what is that? If the active cell is less than 19, then get the tab order. What is the tab order? All it is is F6, I6, in quotes, by separate by comma. Make sure you don't use the absolute, no dollar signs are needed here, just the cell app, just the cell reference, not the absolute. So F10, I10. So basically, all I did was run through every single cell in that tab, which is all of these cells right here. This cell, this cell, this cell. So that's all I did. And as soon as it gets to the last one, which is higher date, right, which is K16 is the last one, it's going to return to F6. So that's how it's designed. When it gets to the last one, it's going to return back, right back up to F6. So if you take a look at this range, the last one is K16, and then it returns to F6. Now, but what if the active cell row is 26? Then it's going to go F26, I26, K26, just three cells, right? Because those are the only ones that users are going to be tabbing through. Again, this time clock history is more for visual effects so that we can see there's not much to do here other than take a look. We may add some features later on with buttons that will select it and click a button or something like that to go to the original transaction. But all we're going to be doing is selecting. We're not going to be tabbing through here. So really, the only ones we're going to be tabbing through are this, this, and this. So we've added that feature. And uh, so just wanted to show you that. And as well as payroll history, again, if it's 46, we're going to go through from F46 to I46 to K46. So again, so that's how we differentiate. So when you want to change that order, all you need to look is here. And in some instances, we need to make two ifs. If the active cell is greater than 65 and less than 76, get this tab order. Greater than 65, less than 76. Well, that would probably be our fourth tab, I believe our fifth tab. Let's take a look at that payroll details here. So here in this case, we need to make sure it's greater than 65 and less than, I believe, what was it, 76. So this is our range. So we want to make sure if the user has selected any cell within this range, then set the tab order. Set that tab order. So that's all we do. It's based on that. So if we're to select this, then it's, nothing's going to happen, right? Because we're selected. But if we select anything above that, it's going to, because we use the parameter less than 76 and greater than 65. So in that case, in that case, set this is the tab order 66 so that's all we did and you can expand on that okay so I would like to see you expand on that so you can create this kind of tab order for any sheet and basically this is the macro that runs the operation this kind of runs it and tells the direction of it and what to go in which case and so it's really really powerful 
and this is used for the up or down you can use up or down arrows which is also really powerful and the up or down arrows are run by these macros right here up or down arrow right here so that is run right here it tells us what to do what to do when there's an up or down arrow so it can be really 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 powerful and it gives us the ability to move or change around tabs when we have that ability so tab order is a great great feature I wanted to show that to you you can focus on that you can customize it there's lots of customizations that can be done there's customizations that can be done with your with if you're within a table, what do you want to happen? Right now, nothing happens, but we can increase this macro. In fact, if you got some suggestions, I would love to hear them. To what would you like to happen when a user is in a table? Would you like to move from cell to cell? Would you like nothing to happen? Give the user the only ability to click. So there's lots of customizations that we can expand on on this feature. So I just kind of wanted to briefly show you how that was done. All right, a great feature that I've added that the, our users and viewers have asked me for that I was happy to add was the ability to switch tabs using shortcut keys. Just like any major application will have, we now have it too. So I've assigned specific shortcut keys, and of course you can change those, and it's really, really very, very easy. And I'm going to show you how that was done. So basically, if I do Control T, it's going to go to time. If I do Control H, it's automatically going to go. Control D, Control U for scheduling. So that's how I've done it. Now, first of all, the first thing we do is we want to underline whatever we've done. And all, I, all we do that, I'm just going to highlight both of them because it'll run the macro if I select just one. So I'm going to select both of them. And so all I needed to do, for example, if I want to, let's say, uh, underline just control U for underline and that'll underline history you see it goes away it's just control U highlight the letter and control U or of course you can always just select go to home and select the underline here that's just easy so all we need to do is highlight the letter and select control U or underline that's how we get the highlighted to know which letter we're going to be using so but how do we run the macro and I'll, remember when we select a specific cell the macro runs right and we know that we can select a cell in the macro runs so now how do we get that on shortcut key for example we also know that we can run a macro based on a shortcut key so knowing that we can run a macro based on a shortcut key and we can do that from here into the developers and we click on macros we just select any macro for example let's see we have schedule let's go ahead and go to employee manager tab pay details we can go into options and control use a shortcut key to run a macro control H is the shortcut key that I've run for this macro I've created a macro let's say pay details click the options and you see control D so now we know how to add our shortcut you can change this to anything you want okay? anything you want I would have liked to use some like for example um, time clock history I didn't use control C I avoid I avoided that I avoided control s because that's used for save so you kinda gotta be careful you don't want to override some common things I didn't use control s I use control U so so things like that it's up to you how you assign yours so I save control s for saving the application because so many of us use that so that's it so now all I've had to do is create some specific macros that all I have to do is the macros just select one cell since we already have that running so we go into the developer tab back into the visual basic and we're going to look at the employee tabs now all I have had to do is create some macros that say if you're on the current sheet we need to make sure that we're on the current sheet for example if I'm not on the current sheet for example let's say control T right if I'm on this sheet I don't want to run that macro right so if the user presses control T which I'm pressing right now I don't want anything to happen so the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're actually on the current sheet so that when we click control T it actually works control our control H for payroll history that it actually works so we want to make sure that we're on the current sheet and again I've used that code name sheet one which allows users to change the actual sheet name and this is the sheet name is always kept so that's perfect so we want to make sure the active sheet is the code name before we actually run our macro and then to run the macro all we need to do is simply select the cell select E4 select L F4 G4 H4 I4 and so on so all that's all because once we select it remember we have the selection change here selection change here that runs our macro here and we go into selection change here this is actually running our macro here selection e4 so when a user selects e4 
through K4, this runs the macro. So we don't need to run those we don't need to run this macro again. All we need to do is select the cell and then this automatically activates. So I thought that was a really great feature and it's especially for those of you that don't like to use the mouse and like to use the keyboard like I do. So once you learn these quick uh, shortcuts, it's really, really easy to, I'm still learning it myself, it's really, really easy to switch between tabs. So I thought that was cool. And all of a sudden, I also wanted to select a specific cell. So when we go into a tab, I want to select the first available cell. So see how I did that? We're selecting the first available, and I added that to the horizontal tabs macro. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Into the employee tabs we go, and we can see here in the horizontal tabs, well, basically, I've added this additional information. It says if B2, B2 runs our tab number, it lets us know what tab we're on. If the value is 5, then F6 select. If the value is 6, so basically this is the first tab, this is the second tab, third, and so on. So we're just telling it if there's a specific tab that's been selected, select the first available cell in that tab. So we've added that. That kind of makes it a little bit quicker. All right, well, I'm really glad I got to show those to you. Those are the two important things we've covered in the employee manager. We've also added leave. Let's go ahead and show that to you. And basically what I have done is I've added an additional database called employee leave list here. And it's very similar to all of our other lists. We have employee leave ID. We have a unique ID for the leave. We have the employee ID, which is absolutely required. We always need an employee ID because we need to know. Employee name, we have a leave type, and everything else is the same as what we're putting on, and we have a row. Now, this row is absolutely critical. All of this row is is just the formula equals row. The reason we have that is when we need to, when we run our advanced filter, we put our employee number in there, we run our advanced filter, and we bring this information right back into here. Bring it right back into here. But if we make a change, let's say I decide I want to make a change, right? Let's go ahead, holiday, non-paid, yes, 15, right? If I make a change to this, I must update that database, right? Here's the database, right? Here's our original list. Here's that 15, okay? I need to update it here. That's the most important, right? So if I go back into the employee manager and I change this to 20, I have to make sure it gets updated right here. It's got to change to 20. How do I do that? I must have this row 10. I must have. I must know. I always know what column it is. The column is pretty simple. But I, I must know what row is it. So what row? So what we do is we bring, we bring that row and put it right here. Now this is going to be hidden, of course, right? We're using L. Now this always is going to be hidden. We're going to color the font the same, but I've kept it open for you. You will see various fonts in here when we do that, but they're all going to be covered in certain sudden history. Some of them are covered already, but you'll see that, you know, in here events, but these are all going to be hidden with the same color as the background. So don't worry about that, right? That's kind of, it's not pretty, but it's, it's very important. So we'll just hide that users will never be able to see that and the we're going to so it's not really important so we don't have to worry about that so the idea is that we must bring that database row in we have to bring it in so here's how it goes we take this employee id we run it through an advanced filter we'll put that employee id right here then well in this case everybody's the same but we're going to go through all of our employee events right and then we're going to filter out only those that have 1222 two, two, and bring that information right in here, including the row number, including the row number. So now we've got the row number. So then we're going to bring all of this information in one shot. We're going to bring it, we're going to copy it over to right here. And then in the second shot, we're going to bring the row numbers in. And I'm going to place them right here. So bring those row numbers in. Now I know if I make a change, I know automatically what. I know automatically what. And what's the row? Well, if this is column H, since everything is the same order, if this is column H, right, I know, and this is column G, so it's one less column. So I know just to bring it one less column, and that's automatically updates it. So that's really cool. Now that's great if there is an existing, but what if it's new? Example, what if in this line, for example, this line, there's nothing here. What if I want to add a new one? Then how am I going to do that? There is no specific database row. So let's say I add a row. Well, boom, now there is. All I need to do is say, tell in VBA, if there's nothing here, then 
all we need to do is find the first row, find the first available row, 11, and add the information here and here. So now we have a row. So, so you see now it's there. It wasn't there before. Let's delete it. I'm going to delete it from the database just so I can show it to you again. We're going to delete this. I'm going to delete this first. I think if I delete it, it's going to create it. Okay, and delete this. All right, so now it's cleared. <laughs> it's added again. Don't worry about that. All right, so it's automatically added. Fair enough. All right, so now let's see. I add one, and it added 12. That's okay because it automatically added 11 because it knows. Because as soon as I make a change, even if it's blank, it's going to write. So now when we change it, right, paid, non-paid, now it creates it automatically. All right, so let's do it again. Let's do it right here. So now there's no row. It's cleared out. Let's take a look at that. It's going to be 13 is our next one, right? 13 is free here. It's going to say, okay, there's no row. I'm going to find the first available row in the, this database, and I'm going to add a new number, a unique new number. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the employee ID. I'm going to add the employee name, and I'm going to add whatever the user has typed in. That's what it's going to do. So, all right, so let's say we put in emergency as a leave type and we have non-paid and we have yes so now all of a sudden a brand new row 13 got created and it placed that new row right here and now we have it here so you see how easy that is now let's show you how that's done in VBA all right into the developers tab we go under the visual basic and we're going to be focused on the range of E168 through H179. These are the ones we're focused on, and of course, column L as well. So if the user makes a change here, we need to do something, and that's what we're going to focus on. So let's take a look under the employee manager here, and we're going to focus on this area. We're going to change. They're actually making a change on employee leave change, right? If user makes a change between 168E and H179, E 160, if they make a change and B1 is false, what is B1? B1 tells us if an employee is being loaded. If an employee is being loaded, this goes to true. We went over this and this goes automatically to true because we're going to load these. And when we load it, we're going to make changes to these, but I don't want anything to happen. So when this goes to true, the employee gets loaded, all these get filled out, and this macro won't run when it's loading. Basically, when it's loading, I don't want anything else to run. I don't want anything to update in the database because it's just loading. So we need, need to make that condition. If B1 is true, don't do anything. So we've got that over there. When the employee loads, it goes to true and then back to false. All right, so we've got that covered. We know why this must be false now. Employee is loading, it's going to go to true. Then what are we going to do? We're going to dimension the leave row is long, the leave ID, we need the leave ID, and the leave list ID is a range. So we're going to focus on that. Now we're going to set the leave list ID to sheet 11 leave list ID. What is that? Let's take a look at that. Back into the name range, if we go into formulas, name manager, and we scroll down to a new list, which we have, and we called it leave list ID, which we can find right here. And when we tab over to that, let's take a look at that, and you'll see that is an offset formula used to locate all of our employee IDs, all employee leave IDs. These are leave IDs. These are unique. Now, let's take a look at this very carefully. We've, you've had some issues before, some of you. When you delete it, all of this data and you want to put in your own data, all of a sudden we have a, a reference error. And that is that happens when we use when we delete all data. But in this case, I've started with row four. Row four is our header row. That's never going to be deleted. So we're going to start there and then we're going to row, we're going to start our count at one down. This offsets it one row down. So we start here and this helps us avoid that ref error when all the data is deleted. So we're going to do that. We're going to count A, count all the text between, again, a4 starting there starting using the header row because when all the data is deleted we don't want an error and then of course we don't want to count the header row in there so we do have to minus one so this is the minus one it deducts that header row so we get an accurate amount and when we tab through this we're going to see that all of our 
data selected in that offset formula. That's the dynamic name range that we do for this employee ID. And the reason we want to set that is because we're going to have to look it up. So let's go ahead and go through, continue our macro. Now that we know what the I employee leave list ID is, and we've determined this as a range, leave list ID is the range. All right, moving on. If L, remember L, L is where our column, where our ID is located. L is where our, here's L. Okay. So we're going to say if it's blank, then we need a new, then we need to add a new one. If it's not blank, then we can use the existing row. So if it's blank, then we need to add a new row in the database. But if it's not blank, we can use this row. That's what we're going to basically tell it now. If L in the target row value equals empty, then a new, then we need to add a new employee. When we add a new employee, we need to do many things. What do we need to do? Well, if not really a new employee, new employee leave item. What do we need to do? Well, I need to do a few things. When it's a new one, I need to make sure that we have the leave ID. I need to make sure that we have the employee ID, the employee name. So those three things are really important. We need to get those in there and we have to make sure this formula gets in there. But the rest of it can be updated every time. So these three things, these one, two, three, four, things must be done for new. Every time there's a new one, it gets updated, those four things. For example, going back into the employee manager, when we add just one item, sick, right? Now, when we go back in, we're going to see on this one, now we have a new employee ID, we have the employee ID, we have the name, we have sick, and we have, so all those things got added on the new one automatically. So we need to do that through the code. So we need to do those four or five items right here. First, what we're going to do is we're going to set the leave ID. We need to know what that leave ID is. We're going to use the max function. Now, because our leave list is all numbers, it's all numbers, we can use the max. So it's going to find the maximum value. So many of you have asked me, how do I find a unique ID? How do I get a unique ID? Well, we use all numbers. And then what we do is we find the maximum number within that list, and then we add one. That's going to give us our unique ID. And we use the application worksheet function to do that. And then, of course, the max formula. Now, of course, that is the same exact thing as if you were adding a, adding a formula. For example, if we added max employee uh, leave, actually, it was a leave, leave list ID there, right? If we max plus one, it's the same thing. There's no difference except it's formatted this time, which you know is not correct, or date. So when we when we see that, it's going to give us automatically our maximum here. So that's how we do it, and that's how it's done. And we can do that either in a formula or we can do that within VBA, and I like to do it in VBA. So I've done it here using the application worksheet function max leave list plus one. It's just one line of code. It's going to get us our unique. So that's going to get us our new unique ID. Now we need to place that in there. So first of all, we need to know range L, first of all, we're going to say the leave row, I missed that, the leave row is going to be the first available row in column A, the first available row, this is the last row with data, the last row with data, then we add one, that's going to give us our first available row, and Excel up, so for example, in this case, our first available row would be row 15, if we add it, it's going to be a row, our last row with data is 14, plus one is 15, so that's what it's going to do, it's going to give us that extra one right there under leave row. So now we have the leave row. We have the leave ID, the new one, the new leave ID. So now we're ready to put in all our information. L, we're going we're gonna to set L in the target row value equals leave row. What I need to do is I need to put that row right here. I need to put it here, right here. I want to put it L, so I'm going to put that right there. That's important. So we'll do that with that line of code. And then also sheet 11, of course, that is our employee leave database. Sheet 11, if you'll see here, sheet 11 right here, employee leave list. That is our new database. In column A, we're going to put the leave ID. In column B, we're going to place the employee ID. The employee ID is in J2. Range J2, that is our employee ID. F2 is our employee name, so we need to place that there, F2. And then, of course, we need to set the row number. The row number is located in column H, and that's just the formula equals row. Now we're set up. Now we've set everything up, so we're good to go on that one. And else, if it's an existing 
the leave row when you set the if it's in existing else means it's already existing l is not blank so it's we're going to set the leave row to whatever is in row l because it's not blank that means it's in existing so now we have the leave row if it's new uh, if it's new here if it's new or if it's existing right so now we've set the leave row either way so now whatever we type in is going to go so now again now we have to actually add the database. So, for example, if it's new, we've added, we've added this, we've added this, we've added this, and we've added this. But we haven't added the leave type yet. We haven't added it. Now we haven't, or whatever the user has changed. There's four different possibilities. They could have changed the paid or non-paid. They could have changed the annual carryover. So if they make a change to the leave type, this is in column D. If they make a change to the leave type here, it's in column E. So basically it's Whatever column, it's one column over. So if they make a change to F, which is the non-paid, paid or non-paid, in this case, it's here in column E. So it's pretty much one column over. So that's all we need to do, except that it's in a different sheet. So back into the code, the leave row and the target column, minus one, minus one equals the target value. So that's how we do it. So it's the target column. Remember, so if this is the if this is the target, if the target column is F, then the target column minus one is E. Target column minus one is E, minus one. So if the target column in this case is G, minus one would be F. So that means annual carryover here is annual carryover right here, F. So that's how we range that. So we just bring that right over. And that's how we can easily, with just one line of code, fill, these, fill the database. All right, so that's great. And when we load it, again, I went over, it's an advanced filter. Let's go over the load real quick, but we've gone over this advanced filter, placing the employee ID here, filling up this row, taking that information, and bringing it back here, because when we change employees, we need it to load also, right? So there's nothing for this employee, but when we bring it back, we need that information to load up automatically. And you notice row 11 didn't have any information, but we can add it, and now it's going to carry now it's going to carry back over since that was a row that we created so that's a really really helpful feature let's go over how we load that and we've added additional macros in the employee load so let's go ahead and employ miscellaneous I'm gonna probably separate this because we've got a lot of macros in this in the employee load we've added one for one particular macro here called employee leave refresh that's gonna refresh the employee leave events if we scroll down we're gonna find that macro right down here there it is and basically all we've done with sheet one is first we're going to clear any previous results in sheet 11 what's that gonna do that is going to let's go back to sheet 11 here what I want to do is I want to clear all this out right? I want to take all that out I want to, any information and I want to clear this out too so I want to clear that information out so that our new advanced filter we can put the employee ID here and run that again so we need to clear out those fields that's what this does we need to take that employee ID, the whatever's in J2, and place it in AA3. That's going to put it right here. AA3 is going to put that. So we know where to filter. We can, and we're going to put our results right here, in a, starting at AA4 and all the way to AE in the last. That's where the results are going to go. So we're going to, first we're going to find the last row. We need to know the last row of our data. Last row in this case will be 14, but we're going to run a uh, some code that tells us what our last row is. So the last leave row is sheet 11, range A99, and L. that's going to tell us our last row. And we need that last row so when we run our advanced filter, we know what, what is our last row of data. A4 is our first row. It must start with our, with our headers. So 4 is where our headers are. And H is the last column running the last leave row. We're going to run an advanced filter. We're going to copy that information. We're going to use the criteria. Criteria is AA2 to A3. That's just the employee ID. That is our criteria. You saw those two cells just a minute ago. And we're going to copy it to the range AA4 through AE4. And in Unique, we want the true values. So all again, all we're doing is copying that information right here so that the results end up below this. 
so that when we run our advanced filter, it automatically adds to it. Let's go ahead and run it. All we need to do is just double click and reset that employee and it's going to run there. And if we take a look at our employee, we see that we have that employee ID in AA2, A3, and we run our criteria from AA2 to A3, and then our results end up there. All right, so that's how we get that macro. And then all we do is we're going to test to see if the last filter row, we're going to test those results to see if, if there's any data. If there's no data, meaning if the last filter row is less than five, we're going to skip this and go to no leave. And if, the, of course, there, if the last filter row is greater than 16, we're just going to set it to 16. And what that means is we have a maximum of 16 rows. Here in our employee manager, we have a maximum, just in case, of a total of 12 rows. 12, excuse me, 12 rows. So what we're going to say is if our last row is 16, 16 is here. So if we scroll up, we'll see this is 12 rows. So if there's 12 Anything, if our last row is anything beyond 16, set it as 16 because I don't want to, we can't copy over more than this amount of the data. So if the last row is beyond that for any reason, which it shouldn't be, but uh, just in case it is, we'll set it. So to make sure that it's, that we've limit. So that's the limit that we'll set. And that brings over our data. The next is we're going to copy the two information, two sets of data. The first set is going to, all we're going to be doing is saying, E168 through H in the last filter row plus 163. Why are we plus? This row starts on 5. This row starts on 168. So the difference is 163. So we're going to copy all that, bring all that data over using value to value copy. No need to copy and paste, just a value to value. So we're going to bring it all the way from E to H and bring it down. And then the same thing for L. So we're just going to bring those values over. And that's pretty much it. Just those last two lines of code bring the information over. So that's it. That's how we run the employee refresh. And that is on leave. So that's how we've covered leave. So now we've covered that. We're going to add in these formulas very soon. We're almost ready. Now we've got the data. So we'll be adding in those formulas. We've got the tab orders. We saved this to the data. So our employee manager is really starting to come together now. Let's move on to scheduling where we've got a lot of new features to cover and let's get to it. All right, we've got a host of new features to show you in the scheduling. Uh, last week we left off with some automated formulas and training and conditional formatting. And now we're going to focus on some additional features that we've added, including a find. If you've got a lot of employees here, as we do here, it's going to, you'd have to scroll down to find that employee. But I wanted to add a quick way to do that without filtering. I wanted to add more of a find and not a filter field. So in case you want to see all the employees, but you want to see something quick, just enter a T and it brings you right to the T's. Or what if we want to add an exact name? Well, for example, let's say we do know them and we want to add it like as in Tilford. We want to add it and it'll go right to that. So we have the ability. Now this is a pretty cool feature and it was actually extremely easy to program using the match formula, using two different types of match formulas right in the same. And the idea is simple, really. We, if we want to get to this, we need to use a match. If we want to find this, we'll need to use a match. We know this is on row 206, but what if it's, what if it's just T? What if it's not matching exactly? Well, we, we have the problem. We can solve that using a, two different types of match formula, which I've put here. And so basically this idea, this, uh, this long formula here is what we're going to do. And so basically, let me just simplify it. Let's say we want to find this person, Tilford, all right? We use the match formula equals match. And then we're going to look up, let's say we want to look up this value, Stacy, comma. And then we're going to look it up employee name, where we have the employee names. And we're going to look it up. And then we want, of course, we want an exact match. So we're going to put zero. And that's basically going to tell us 199. But in actuality, if you look here, it's actually 206. So we need to add seven. The reason we're adding seven is because our list starts here on row eight, right? So we need to add seven because the first value it finds is going to be one, but we really want row eight. So we need to add seven to our formula. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we add seven to that formula plus seven, it's going to give us the exact row. And that works great, 206. But what if what if it's not? What if it's not the same? Then how are we going to figure it out? Because this is for an exact match. So for example, if we just put in, you know, S, for example, actually, let's just put in S, something that doesn't exist, right? We, I need to know what it's not found. We get an error, right? Well, I don't want an error. I want to know what row, even if it's close. So, but what if it's an error? Well, if it's an error, if error, 
right? Then do something else. What should it do? Then I want to find the closest match. Well, what is that? Match D3, right? employee name. But we're going to use the closest match below, less than. We want the closest match. So it's one. We're going to use one, which is less than, right? We'll use that. And then we can do plus seven and see what that happens there. Okay, in that case, there we go. Now we've completed it. Plus seven, if error, let's go ahead and, if there's an error, right, then do this. Then we get the close match, which is 195. So if we type in S, S, we're going to get the closest. So now we know what the closest is. So now we have both options, right? If it's an if it's not an error, it's going to return that. So now we're using two different types of match, two different two different match types, and that's going to allow us to get either an exact match or a partial match. And that's just what I've done. Let's go ahead and delete that because we have that formula already. Let's go ahead and show you that formula. So now it's even simpler. So basically we're saying if it's an error, if this first one is an error, then use the partial match. So that covers us, all right? So, but let's see if it's blank. If it's blank, we don't want an error either. So let's let's add something to compensate for that as well. So we can do, we can wrap this all in an if error, all of it, comma, and then just return blank. That way we never did an error. There we go. Blank, we've compensated for if it's a partial match. So if we type in S, it's going to return the first S. So if we type in T, it's going to automatically go to the first T. But if we type in, because 198 is the closest row there, right? 198. But if we type in a full name like T-H-R-A-L, and there it is right there. It moves right to that cell, so it moves right to the specific cell. So if we try it again, right, typing in an exact, all of a sudden it moves exactly to that. Now maybe I'll find some other macro to bring back up to the top. That would be nice to have another macro to bring it all the way back up to the top. So we'll work on that as well. That's pretty simple to do. And the reason we do that is so now that we know the row, but how do we get it automatically to scroll to that specific row? We have the row, but how do we get it to do that? Well, that's just a simple macro, very simple. Let's go into the Developers tab, Visual Basic, and we'll go into our module Scheduling Max here. And we have one line of code called Scheduling Scroll to Row. And all we're going to do is we're going to Active Window Scroll Row equals Sheet eight range b3 and all that does b3 is where that row it's going to scroll to that particular one and all we need to do is run a change event on this particular and run this macro on change so for example in the scheduling let's go ahead and look in the scheduling sheet here when we have worksheet change if there's a change to d3 d3 is where we're focused on and b3 value doesn't equal empty we'll make sure that there's no value in fact we could probably put if b3 equals empty return let's do that right let if nothing then and b3 then schedule row else right let's try something else else why don't we go back up to the top right that would be nice then active window scroll right scroll row row equals I think it was seven right seven there so now if it's blank it'll automatically go to the seven so that might be kind of nice that way we can get it back up there so if they delete it let's take a look now it was already at the top so there we go let's go ahead and go back to the top let's go back back to let's go to W and now let's delete it and there it goes back up top there we go I think that works pretty good so so what we do is we provided an option when the user clears it out it goes back up to the top so if we type in T it goes to row number seven and then they clear it out there we go I like that better so now we have the option to scroll to the top just like that all right so else that means if it's if it's if it's empty or if they've made other changes let's go ahead and make this one little to change nothing then I'm gonna I'm gonna put this into a little bit then, and I'm going to go down here, and we're going to put an F in, because there's one more thing. Let's go ahead and add an if there. If, if, then this is what I want to do. I want to wrap that, because I don't want... I don't want to run with both of these conditions. I only want this to run if it's empty, then schedule roll else. If it's not empty, then do this. If it is empty, do this. So that's all I want to do. And that's only when D3 changes. So that's a little bit better code. And now we'll operate uh, a little bit 
faster and only when we focus on this row here. So let's go ahead and test that out again. T scrolls there, clear it out, and boom, back. All right, good. So now we're good at this. Now we have the ability to show the capacity or hide the capacity. So that's also just a simple macro. If we right click that, click assign macro, and we take a look that we have a macro called schedule, show, and hide capacity. And all we're really doing is hiding row seven with that. So back into the scheduling module here, and we see scheduling show hide capacity. If B7 equals true, then seven hide equals false, right? So if it's true, why would that, why would B7 be true or false? Let's look at that. Right click here, go into format control, and you'll see that this is connected to B7. So that B7 is either true or false based on the option that we check. If it's false, it's going to be hidden. You're not going to be able to see it, but you'll see it went to false real quick, and then it's going to go back to true. So this is going to be either true or false based on the conditions. If it's false, the row is going to be hidden. If it's true, the row is going to be displayed. It's a very simple macro, and you could use that. Now, the idea is I don't like the font, and I don't like the font of this actual, so I actually didn't put a font there. If you'll see, I didn't do that, so I didn't type anything in because I don't like the font. So I've used the font of the, uh, let's clear that out. So basically, I've just used the cell. I've used the cell behind it to use the font. This way we can control the font a lot easier, how it looks. So, and then I've spread this out to cover it. So you could spread this out as long or as high, you know, so that the user can click on it and have some good functionality there. So that's a little trick to create your own font with those. So I did that, and that basically shows a capacity. Now the capacity is a really cool feature, and basically what I've done is add conditional formatting to this, and you can see if we add some just some text here, you're gonna see that percentage gradually go down, go down to 94, and we've added some formatting so that the bar goes down. So as we add text here, so it's based on text, you know, because the events are considered text, this goes down, so capacity. So of course, the more, the less employees you have, the more it's gonna affect it. So it's based on the employees. So let's take a look at this formula. And basically what I want to do in this formula is I want to count, I want to know all of the employees. We want to know how many available employees there are. So in this case, in this case, we were starting at eight, and we're gonna go all the way down to, actually, it's gonna go down to two here, 225. But I have formulas here, so we can't, we can't measure it based on text, because there's formulas in here, so we have to make, measure it on non-zeros. In other words, this is, this is zero, this is not a zero. So we can use that to determine our entire list. So we need to count all the people in our list because I need to know what the maximum. If there's a hundred people in the list, there's exactly 100 people. We have a capacity of a hundred. And so if 10 people are off on that day, we have a capacity of 90%. 10 people are on leave. There's a hundred potential available. 90 are, 90 are available. 10 are on leave. So we have a 90% capacity. So it's a really great feature to be able to know what your capacity is on that particular given day. So you can also put availability. There's a few ways to modify this, but basically what we've done is the first thing we want to do is we want to know what our capacity is. And we're going to count all the potential rows, 1,000 rows. And what I want to do is I want to count the blanks, counting the blanks B1000. So how many, however many blanks there are, 1,000 minus is going to be our number. All right, so we know that if we count the blank ones and subtract from 1,000, it's going to give us our total employees. Because what I want to know is how many employees. In this case, we have a total of, I believe, 218. So if we highlight and click here, we're going to see we've got a total of 218 all the way from two from 7 to 225 is a total of 218. So we're just going to count the blank rows Count the blanks and then subtract all of them. That's going to give us our full row. So we know how many employees there are. All right. So now that we know how many employees there are, we also need to know how many of those employees have something going on. How many of those are text? We can count the text. So now we have to count the number of text. So what we can do is, again, we use 1,000 to count our employees, but we're going to use an offset formula starting at D8, starting at D8, and what I want to do is I want to know 
how many are non-zeros and why non-zero because when we copy down that formula there becomes zero I'm going to unhide this. Now, if you remember in the last lesson, we take this formula and we copy it down here and then we paste the values. So when we refresh this, you'll see that they get copied all the way down. So we want to know anything that's non-zero, non-zero. We can do that when this formula right here does not equal zero. So we're going to run an offset. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to count how many we're offsetting, 1,000 minus, so we know how many are count ifs, count if offset. So this is going to give us our range. Let's go through this formula so you can see how it works. Under the formulas, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the formula, and we're going to take a look at exactly how that works. So when we click evaluate, we're going to see we have 1,000 minus 782. So we have a total of 2 hundred to go down so we're going to offset starting at d8 we're going to offset we're going to count how many non-zeros starting at d8 going all the way down to 218 in one column again what we're going to do is we're going to count all of the non-zeros starting at d8 and going 218 down so when we go through it now we see our range count if d8 through D25, D8 through, through DA225 does not equal zero. How many of those? Well, in this case, now we're going to continue on and we see that there's 21 non-zeros, 21 non-zeros. And now what we're going to do is we're going to divide that. How are we going to divide that? We're going to divide that by all of the potential potential employees. And in this case, it's 1,000 by counting the blanks. Evaluate, we notice we have 782 blanks. So that means we have 218 non-blanks. So 218, so 21 divided by 218 is basically 10%. And then if we subtract one from that, we're going to get 90%. So 90% basically is going to give us that information. So if we've got 21 of 10, you know, basically 21 is 10% of 218. So we've got 10%. I want to know how much capacity, how much is available. I don't want to know how much is full. If we just left it at 21 divided by 218, it would give us 10%. Well, 10% is on leave, right? 10% is on leave, but I don't want to know how much is on leave. I want to know what is available. So we subtract 1 minus 10%, and that's going to give us our 90%. 90% is available to work. So that's what I wanted to show you, and that gives us our 1 minus 0 0.009, and that gives us our 90.4%. So that's how we arrive at that formula. Now let's take a look at the conditional formatting. If we go into the Home and Conditional Formatting Manage Rules, we can take a look at just one conditional formatting, and this is used for both F7 through AJ7, which is our month view, and our week view, which is DA7 through DG. And we've applied the same thing for week and month view, so it's very helpful. We're using a data bar, and all we're doing in this data bar is we're going to set it on automatic. We're going to use a data bar. We're using a solid fill, so it's kind of automatic. It tells it, it knows right automatically based on the 90% is going to fill it up. So it's really very basic. It's just I've chosen not to use a border. We could use a border here. It might look a little bit interesting. Uh, let's take a look. If we add a border to this, we can add a little bit, and then that's going to make maybe our maybe it's going to make it a little clearer. So that adds a little bit of border around it. So we know that our capacity is 90%. We're running at 90% capacity that day because 10% is on leave. So that's a really powerful feature, especially for when you want to know uh, how many. Uh, people are out or how many people are what kind of capacity you're running so I thought that's available and it's also available for month view too on month view we have that let's let's go back to the previous month where we had some data in there there we go so now we can see that in fact this one's 99 percent we only have a few information so they're running it relatively 100 percent but as you add more this will decrease in the data bars so we have it for month view as well but i don't have enough uh, here this one's running at 98 percent because i have you know just four people out so it gives you a great idea and a great potential to really make good decisions uh, when you're running this employee manager so the scheduling component is really awesome so i'm glad i got to show that to you we also added back the uh 
pop-ups for holiday that wasn't working because we had made some changes but it is now so that's working great this is also working well as we've done this display all positions this is going to be a drop down list so that we can filter out based on positions or employee types that's going to come in the next particular training so i want to show it to you that's what this is for and that's going to be for both week view and monthly you're going to be able to filter based on employee positions employee positions of course are those in the admin screen when you see employee settings here it's going to be based on these employee type positions so this range it's going to be based on or showing all so that's going to be really great that's going to be coming in the next training the the last and the best feature that i wanted to show you today is the ability to automatically schedule leave based on let's go ahead and hide this based on just simply selecting either in month view so if you want to select a leave you can just highlight that right click add a leave event add a holiday and click it once and automatically the name, the holiday, the leave, the leave type, the employee name, the starting on and the ending on are automatically set. So we're going to, oh, these are just notes for me. Let me get rid of those. You don't need those. Those are some notes I got to add, some things I want to add. <laughs> Put them in the red. Okay, so events. So, so you can just add your, your holiday, your event notes here. And then just click save and it's done. It's that quick. So I can't wait to show you how we did that feature and automatically it's in there. Now let's go ahead and if we don't want to see these, there's one thing I wanted to show you before we get to that. Let's go ahead and update this. We don't want to see the leaves. So if we go into the home conditional formatting, manage rules, we want to make the font the same color. So we're going to edit that rule, format that. And what we'll do is we'll make the font here and we're going to go to the second gray here. That's going to hide that. Now a few of you have asked me, uh, what if I, well let's go ahead and apply that so those are raised. What if I what if I want to show the leave? What if I don't want to show? I want to show the leave through the weekend. You have the ability just by changing this. So, for example, if we move weekend down and then click apply, you see that event is going to cover the weekend. But if you don't want, it's more of a preference. So I don't know which one you want, but you can easily switch. So just by moving these up and down, you can see which rule takes precedence, whether it's the leave that takes precedence or it's the weekend that takes precedence. And you could do that just by moving them around using this up and down key. So that's pretty beneficial. Okay, so when we select, when I select a specific range of time, I know the employee because they're here. I know the start date, it's up here. And I know the end date, it's up here. So if I know all of those things, then all I really need to do is figure out what leave type and I need to, and then that's it. Then I can create an event with all that information. But the first challenge is these event types are dynamic, right? These event types, let's right click. The first challenge is these event types are all dynamic. The user can put in whatever they want in the admin screen. So for example, let's look, go back into the admin and look at the leave types. What if we put in hangover, right? I need that to show up there as well because it's now a leave type as well. So back into the scheduling, we need to make sure that that's dynamic so that when the user right clicks and adds an event type, hangover becomes visible. So when we add hangover, it's just done just like that. So that's our first challenge. So let's go ahead and see how we did that out of that right click dynamic right click functionality, which is an extremely powerful feature. So I'm excited to show that to you. Into the developers tab we go and into Visual Basic, we have additional module here called right click menu. And basically what I want to do is I want to create buttons based on the values in that admin screen. When you see here in admin, I want to create right click based on these values. I want to find the last row. In this case, it's 12. I want to loop through all of them and I want to create a button for each of those. So we're going to show you just how we did that here into the right click call events. Now this is run, this macro is run every time you click right click only on the scheduling screen. When you right click here and you, excuse me, when you go to the workbook and you right click here, we can see here under the before right click, sheet before right click here, before right click, that's where we're going to run our, the first thing we want to do is we want to delete any specific if we don't run this, it's going to add and add and add to our right-click menu. You always want to delete it because each time we're creating a new one, so we want to make sure that each time we also delete it before we, because otherwise it's going to add duplicate menu buttons, so we don't want that. So we always want to make sure we delete first before we do anything else. 
So we delete it and then we recreate it each time. So if the active sheet code name, again, code name, we're using this today, sheet eight, then right click call events. Then we're gonna run this macro right here. So that's how we get the macro to run. And let's take a look inside that macro so we can see exactly what we're doing here. All right, right click call events located in module right click menu. First, we're going to mention is the last leave type rows long. We need to get the last row so we can loop through those and pull them out. And we're going to get the leave type. That's the current leave type row. And to mention the leave button as a command bar pop up. This is going to give us our button. So we need to determine that because that's what we're going to be focused on to create that button. And we're focused on sheet four in this case, which is the admin, because we need to pull up all of the leave types. So we need to focus on that. And we need to get the last leave type row. In this case, G24 would potentially be the last row up. So it's from this up. So again, G24 is potentially our, our last row. It's actually G23. So from that all the way up, this is going to get us our last row starting here and pulling it all the way up. What is the last row? In this case, it's 12. So we're going to run from 7 to 12. It's going to get us all of our leave types. In this case, we just have 6. So we know what we're doing. Let's go ahead and continue on. On Air Resume Next, again, we're going to delete, just in case, again, delete any ad bars. If for some reason there are no ad bars, no ad event, it would return an error. So we, we use On Air Resume Next because if there was none, it would return an error. So that's why we use on error resume next. So with the application, we're going to focus on the command bars, deleting the first. And then the secondly, we want to set the leave button. Remember, we've determined that as a command bar pop up here. We're going to include the command bar cell and we want to controls and we want to add before one. That means I want to add them to the top, right? I want to when I right click, I want to add this menu right on the top, right at the top. So before one before the first position so that we get them added right to the top of the menu because that's where I wanted to place them. And next up, we're gonna, it's a control pop up. That's the type I want. The pop up means it's this type where it pops up. You see, that's a pop up. It's not a normal menu, it's a pop up. And I just added a little calendar icon here. So that's the type, pop up is the type and that's gonna give us our sub menus. That's gonna give us our sub menu. So pop up is the first and now what we're gonna say is with this leave button, this leave button, we're going to add a caption, and that's called add leave event. That caption is going to give us our text, right? We need a text for that add leave event. If we were to change it there, it'd change automatically. And next up, so we've got our caption, and now what we need to do is I need to pull all of our sub menu values. I need to pull all of these values right here, starting at sick, vacation, holiday. I need to pull all these values. So we're going to run a loop. We can do that with a loop starting at 7. Why are we starting at 7? Because our row here starts on row 7. So we're going to use those rows starting at row 7 all the way to the last row. In this case, it's 12. We're going to loop through all of those. So we can do that for the leave type row equals 7 to the last leave type row. Again, last leave type row is determined here for XL end up row, which is the last value. And we're going to say with each one of those add type a button we're going to add an ms control type button that's the button that we want to add we're going to give each one a caption but what is the caption going to be each one's different sheet 4 g and the leave type row remember this leave type row increases so whatever g is g and the leave type row 7 would be 6 g and the leave type row 8 would be vacation so that way as it runs through the loop it's going to give each one a different name so that's going to, this will give us, a, and then for each one, we're going to give a, I have the same face ID, which is 612, this calendar. You can uh, give it any number and it will give it a different type. You can search on Google for face ID and it will give you a little icon with a different number. So you can create your own icon. Maybe mine is not so creative. All right. And then on action, I want to run a macro. I want to run a macro, but each one has a different macro because I've got to specify. So what I've done is I've created I'm sure there's a faster way to do this, but I've created 15. Somebody tell me there's a faster way to do this. So I've created multiple macros for seven, eight, depending upon the row that was selected. And so uh, I've done that, create the event, the macro, and the part of the macro is the leave type row name. So this is going to create the macro. Whatever the leave type row is, if the row is seven, the macro is going to be create leave event seven which would run this macro right here.
All right, so that's the macro that runs when that button is clicked. And this we don't need. All right, so that's pretty much it. We don't need this. It runs fast enough without that. We don't need that. Okay, so that's all we did. That's all we need to do. And it's going to go to the next lap. So it's going to loop through these, right? Four, here's our four next loop. Four. So it's going to go do this. In fact, it's going to do this six times for each item in our list. And it's going to create that list. And then if the user clicks, clicks the button, it's going to run this macro. Well, let's take a look at those macros. All we're going to do is we're going to set the leave row and then run the same macro. We're going to run this macro. In this case, we're setting the leave row to 7. In this case, we're setting the leave row to 8 and so on. So it's a very, very simple macro. I'm sure it could be simplified even more, actually. And the reason is we've dimensioned leave row as up here. So it's not part of any macro. So that it's constant for this module. It's constant so that, it's, so that it will not change. So we've set the leave row and then we're going to create the leave event. So let's take a look at this create leave event macro and I've put that right here. All right, so in this create leave, what I basically, again, what I want to do is I want to create a leave event. I want to create a brand new event. Let's go back into the events here. And what I want to do is I want to create an event name and I want to specify. I've decided I want to use the first name of the person. I want to use the specific event type lead the event type and then i want to use it you can customize this however you want it this was just my quick idea using the person's first name then using the leave type and then using the word leave so i just use that as a quick type because it's a nice way to automatically create an event name then of course the event type is leave the employee is the employee name we know that we know the starting on and we know the ending on date so that is going to be great to show you and I'll show you how we get it. And of course the leave type is hang over here because that's the one they've selected. We know the leave type is because we've made the number constant. We'll go through that for you in detail. All right, so with this particular macro, the, we need to know the selected row. That is the, the row. I need to know a few things that are very important. In the scheduling here, I need to know what row they've selected. In this case, it's 11. I need to know how many cells they've selected in the row. I need to know the starting position because I need to know the end date. So in this case, for example, our row would be 11. Our starting column would be H, right? Or in this case, you know, it's right 3, right? And, uh, excuse me, October 3rd, which is the point. And if it's selected 3, then the last day would be October 5th. So I need to know that. So I need to know that they've selected three rows, three columns. I need to know that they've selected three columns. I need to know that they've selected row 11. And I need to know, in fact, that the first column, you know, equals column, right? I need to know also the column that it's eight. I need to know that eight. So, so we need to get that information so we can do that with just a few lines of code. So we're going to dimension the selected column as long, dimension selected columns, plural, how many did they select? we need to know the end date as long the date row what is the row of the date and the employee row as long so we need to know all of that the selected row the select row equals the active cell row the selected column equals the active cell column and then of course the selected columns how many did they select equals the selection columns count i need to know how many columns they've selected because i need to know the end date i know the starting date but i need to know the end date this will tell us our ending date. Next up, I need to know if they're on the week view or month view, and that's important. If they're on the week, if they're on the month view, the date is going to be in row four, right? But what if they're in the week view? If they're in the week view, the date is going to be in row five. You see the date here, but I want to be able to do this also in the week view. So if you right click and add an event and add a hangover, I want to be able to do that very easy. Just click save event and then go back to scheduling and it's in the week view as well. So I want to do that in week view, but in the week view, our date is in row five. So there's a differentiation between those two. So I need to make compensate for that inside the code. And how do we know whether we're on week view or month view? Well, we know based on the column they've selected. For example, if the column is less than, in this case, less than 40, then the date row equals four, then they're on the month view. But if the column otherwise, the date row equals five. So we can use the selected column because the month comes first, so that's less than 40. And of course, the week view. Uh, else, it's five. So this is the, the week view. Okay, so five. Again, five is the week view because this column is 
da it's larger column number so then we know it's five so that's so we need to because we need to know where the date is that date is important so that tells us the row so we've defined the date row either at four or five all right next up the employee row is the actor cell row minus four why is that let's take a look at that i need to know if the first employee in this row is eight right row eight but in our employee information, because I need to pull some of the information in our employee list, our first row is four. So Asian Flores is located in four. If I want if I want her first name, I, need, I know it's in column C. And four is the first in this case. But Asian Flores in the scheduling, in fact, is in column, is in row eight. So of course we need to subtract four in order to get that. So that's why the employee row is actually eight minus four and that's going to get us because we need to pull that first name so in order to do that i subtract four and then of course i know it's c so that's going to come in handy in just a bit back into our code so we know the employee row now we're going to focus on with sheet five we're focused on the events sheet the first thing we want to do is activate it so i'm going to activate that sheet because we need to do some things on there and then i want to select it so we need to do that we need to activate it the first thing we want to do is add new event we're going to run that macro that adds the new event and clears out all the fields and gets it ready for a brand new event so that's done e4 what is an e4 e4 is our event name and our event name is, remember, it's made up of really three things when we create these automatically. Our event name is, lo in this case, it's the first name, it's the, it's the type, event type, and then it's the event leave type, I should say, and then the word leave. So it's those three things that we're, gonna, we're, we're creating. We can do that here. So we know, let's get out of that cell there, all right? And so we know that sheet two, which is our employee list, C is column C is the first name column and the employee row this is going to get us our first name so we have that then we're going to do and in a space and then we're going to continue on we're going to continue on with sheet 4 G and the selected leave row value what is that well we know the leave row value is 7 8 9 10 11 based on whatever we've set right here remember based on the macro that run the leave value could be 9 could be 8 why is this important because that's for example if it's 7 then we know that the leave that they've selected would be 6 if it's 12 it's hangover okay so we, that's very important so we know that g sheet 4 this is sheet 4 g and g12 is hangover so that's very important so we know that so so that select the leave row and g sheet 4 that'll tell us our leave type and then the word leave that's going to build us our event leave name so we have that that's set up and now H4, that's the type of event that we're focused on. This is going to be leave type of event. And of course, we want to know the person's full name. K4 is the name. That's where in the event. K4 is where we put that name. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we need the full name there. And what is that? Well, that's simple. That's simply the uh, selected row plus whatever is in D here in the scheduling training. So here, sheet 8, D, and the selected row is the full name. Now the start date, we start date goes in G10, J10 on the events, and that's going to be the date row. Remember, we set that either to four or five, and the selected column. The selected column is going to give us our start date. Next up, I want to know the finish date, and that's going to be sheet eight, our date row, four or five, the selected column, the current column, plus the selected column, plus the number of columns that we selected minus one. That's going to get us our end date. There we go, that's our end date. And then the last but not least is our leave type. Again, it's G in the selected leave row, and that goes in N10. So N10 is where our leave type goes, which is right here. N10 is our leave type. Now we're ready, and the last thing I want to do is I just want to select E6. I want to select that so that the user can put in some notes and click Save. That's it. That's all I want them to do. So I've selected E6, and then and then that's it. That's the end of the macro, and that does it. If we were to do that again, and just put in two days. Let's say we want to leave. Right click, add event, click no show, and it's done. And E6 is selected. And all the user has to do is put in some notes here, 
and just click save and it's done that quick back into the scheduling and you'll see automatically it'll appear so that's a super fast way to add events and i'm really glad i got to show that to you today it's an extra long training but we had so much to cover let's go ahead and take a look a little bit of a summary of what we've gone over we've covered the tab order we've covered tab shortcut keys we've covered employee leave list and refresh we've done through the capacity formula and the conditional formatting. We've done show or hide capacity, and we've done schedule conditional formatting hierarchy. We did cover that. And of course, the last thing we did was the events uh, right click dynamic list, and of course, scheduling events based on just selection. So we've covered a whole lot today. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to uh, next week's training. We'll get this uh, completed in uh, two or three or four weeks, depending upon your suggestions, but it's going to be a, a fantastic employee manager. So stick with it. Please share it. Please like it. I always appreciate your comments, suggestions. Thank you so much for joining me today.